Rob Chodat in the English department at Boston University is, oh, I didn't know this, Rob. You were chair of the English department at Boston. My commiserations, where he teaches courses on post-World War II literature, aesthetics, and literary theory. He's the author of two books, Worldly Acts and Sentient Things, The Persistence of Agency from Stein to DeLillo, and The Matter of High Words, Naturalism, Normativity, and the Post-War Sage. He's published articles on pragmatism and evolutionary aesthetics, narrative theory and literary style, among other things. And with John Gibson, he's now co-editing a new volume of essays on Wittgenstein and literature, forthcoming from Cambridge. In a late essay on the investigations, Cavell discusses the kind of unity or reordering of ordinary words one finds in aphorisms. Uh, quote, forms of ordinary words that partake of completeness, pleasure, the sense of breaking something off. Aphorisms are words that epitomize, set off a thought with finish and permanence uh, from the general range of experience, unquote. Uh, Cavell himself was a gifted aphorist, but the idea of the conference today rests on the fact that he sought to write books. Lengthy texts with a different kind of completeness and pleasure, a different kind of finish and permanence, you might say, uh, and with its own kinds of accents and resonances and layers, all patently distinct from the dominant genre of his field, namely the discrete argumentative journal article. Must we mean what we say? Recall is subtitled A Book of Essays, and that was followed by The World Viewed and then The Senses of Walden, both of which were obviously meant uh, to be something more internally coherent and whole than uh, just a collection or a compilation. The latter is not only an independent book, but it's about an independent book. Walden has written, Cavell claims near the start, as a singular, quote, sacred text. Similarly, and unlike many commentators, Cavell rarely mentions uncertainty or lecture in ethics or any other Wittgenstein text in order to stitch together some specifiable position on a given topic. The fact that Wittgenstein labored for years over the investigations really mattered a lot to Cavell, even if the only holes that Wittgenstein himself managed to uh, complete were organized arrangements of highly polished remarks. So there's something very appropriate about uh, the suggestion that we focus on the claim of reason rather than Cavell's writing as such today. In its breadth, its weave of topics, its overall arc, it has a distinctive personality. Choosing a specific passage from this book uh, was challenging for me because when Toro wrote me, I was with my family in London. My wife routinely expresses exasperation and how little I pack when we go away. And this time I actually agreed with her. Uh, I didn't have the book on me. And yet being in London also wound up having some benefits. For a few days after the invitation arrived, as I was wandering around Bloomsbury looking for a copy of Claim of Reason, and combing my memory for passages uh, that have been important to me, an article appeared in The Guardian that reminded me of a moment in The Claim of Reason that brings into focus Cavell's thinking about the arts and criticism, why they matter, what challenges uh, they force us to face, and what challenges they face, uh, and that'll be my theme for the next few minutes. The Guardian article was titled, Students Don't See the Value, Why A-Level English is in Decline. It's a sort of journalistic piece that you see every week, it seems, uh, in the US, but I, for one, had never seen a specifically British version of it. The usual reasons for English's decline were named, employment fears, parental pressure, but one high school literature teacher mentioned something slightly more nuanced. Recently, he had had, he reported, a gifted student who loved literature. But the student was concerned, as the teacher put it, quote, that a difficult question on a final paper could lead to a disappointing result. Whereas, if he knew the maths and he knew the physics, he would be much more confident of achieving his expected grade, unquote. I take this reported remark to exemplify an idea that Cavell often proposed, that philosophical problems are not the special terrain of intellectuals, the sorts of questions that a grown-up, including an A-level student, can't help but have. And this particular grown-up is asking about knowledge, as it's manifest in different tasks and different kinds of educational spheres. In his view, math and physics are fields in which knowledge has a relatively stable sense. If one knows them, he says, one can be confident of achieving good results, and there are recognizable ways, he implies, of knowing when one knows them. By contrast, English is discomfortingly unpredictable. 
You can't be confident that you know what matters, or that what you think matters matches the teacher's idea of what matters. If you and the teacher don't share a sense of what's most worth asking about and trying to answer, the results, quote unquote, the results would be perilous. The remark called to mind the moment in part four of the claim of reason when Cavell offers an example of something that I know but cannot prove, and this is on the handout. Something that I know but cannot prove, quote, the closing image of for whom the bell tolls, the hero dying in a pine forest in Spain, holding a rearguard action alone to give his companions time for their retreat, alludes to or remembers Roland's death in the Song of Roland. The context for the remark is Cavell's reflections on Wittgenstein's remark that, quote, my attitude towards him is an attitude towards a soul. Not that I have an opinion or belief that someone has a soul, but I have a certain stance toward that person. Let's not intellectualize our lives, as Cavell often suggests. Specifically, Cavell has been thinking about Wittgenstein's observations near the end of the long central sections of part two of the investigations about the complexities of judging, quote, whether an expression of feeling is genuine or not. Most of the time, notes Wittgenstein, we effortlessly share judgments of uh, color terms. There are ways, he said, of establishing color blindness. It's part of what characterizes the concept of a judgment of color. By contrast, it's possible for us to disagree about whether someone is, for example, exasperated, without one of us making a mistake in reasoning or an observation. You and I perceive the same pursed, <laughs> pursed lips or raised brow, but we see them as one thing rather than another, perhaps exasperation perhaps pretend exasperation, perhaps some neighboring yet distinct state like bafflement or rage. The possibility of such disagreements doesn't mean, however, that there isn't such a thing as expert judgment, that's Wittgenstein's term, expert judgment about our recognizing exasperation and other attitudes. Such judgment may have less intersubjective agreement about than, what's, uh, than what's red or blue. But even here, says Wittgenstein, there are those whose judgment is better and those whose judgment is worse. Think of the way, for example, that we say, someone does or doesn't know how to read a person, or someone does or doesn't know how to read a room. Can one learn this knowledge, Wittgenstein goes on? Yes, some can. Not, however, by taking a course, but through experience. And teaching someone is not a matter of learning systematic rules, but of giving the right tip. The evidence in such cases, says Wittgenstein, will often be, quote, imponderable. Subtleties of glance, of gesture, of tone. Differences which I might be quite incapable of describing. What is most difficult here is to put this indefiniteness concretely and uns unfalsified into words, he says. In the course of our lives, we simply recognize certain expressions as clearly genuine, but we cannot prove anything, unquote. Cavell's comment on for whom the bell tolls is a way of extending these Wittgensteinian meditations turning them in a direction that he'd also introduced in the preceding paragraphs in a parenthetical comment on Hegel's philosophy of fine art. Quote, thus may the philosophy of mind become aesthetics. That's from page 357. That is, understanding the mind means embodied, understanding embodied persons with all the fine-grained differences in attitude and gesture and feeding, fleeting look that persons display. And this understanding of embodied persons is analogous to, can be compared to, is illuminated by, parallels our understanding of embodied works of art. To know both another mind and another work of art, and a work of art is to interpret a physiognomy, as Cavell sometimes puts it. Aesthetics is thus not a marginal area of inquiry, a domain whose judgments have no more weight than those of theology and ethics, but, but a vivid case of how we make sense of expressive activity in minded creatures generally. Everything in art is there in the work, on the surface, as it were, whether that surface is composed of sound or color or words or something else. And yet that surface is more complex, more densely woven than we imply in our naked appeals to entity-like things called meanings. Like our judgments of persons, judgments about artworks involve a high degree of indefiniteness, as Wittgenstein says. But there are nevertheless those whose judgment is better and worse, and one can gain this knowledge by experience, by having the right tips. The way I understand for whom the bell tolls, mirrors or parallels, or Cavell says is allegorical for, the way I understand my wife's exasperation. There are different cases, they involve different kinds of challenges and obstacles, but both the book and my wife need to be read. 
both tasks can be carried out responsively or clumsily. And with both, it's hard to tell ahead of time how much our antecedent judgments will help us grasp what is right in front of us. And here I'll go back to the passage itself a little bit more. The closing image of For Whom the Bell Tolls alludes to or recalls <coughs> Roland's death in the Song of Roland. The claim is meant to be surprising, and part of the surprise lies in the sheer historical distance between these two works. Most scholars date the Song of Roland to the 11th century. Hemingway's novel was published in 1929. A great deal had changed in the intervening eight centuries in the techniques and technologies of war, justification for war, how we think of violence and valor, and so on and so forth. The remark is surprising, too, because unlike Joyce or Eliot or Pound, Hemingway shied away from sophisticated-looking references to literary history. He preferred the role of the unbookish, straight-talking American. To draw a connection between Hemingway and Roland is thus to go out on an interpretive limb. And Cavell's aim is to exploit the tangle of commitments and risks that are undertaken when I do so, and thus to imagine what kind of unprovable knowledge such a claim might involve. What's always stood out for me most about this passage, and the reason why I wanted to choose it, is how immensely fragile Cavell presents such claims as being. The Hemingway role in proposal is immediately followed by an explicit, explicit admission that it won't convince everyone. An acknowledgment offered in one of the briefest sentence of, sentences of the entire passage, quote, it is not to be expected that everyone will credit this. I love that line, and I wish it would place at the top of every article published in PMLA. <laughs> that is, critical claims make plain to us how and that, and here I'm adapting something that Cavell says uh, in various places in, in the claim of reason, how and that we are separate, endlessly separate, for no reason that you are there and I am here. Such separateness seems to be the main reason that in offering the Hemingway role in proposal, one, ought, one is or ought to be naturally reticent about saying such, saying such things, unquote. I'm not reticent because I'm unsure of my knowledge. In the present case, says Cavell, I am not. I'm reticent instead because my claim reveals not only what I think of Hemingway, but also what I think of us. The rest of this paragraph, this first paragraph, sketches out this reticence with the acuity of a careful psychologist, someone who, like Cavell, had both been a patient in therapy and studied it formally. And there's a kind of web of uh, wishes and desires and fears that, are, that he uh, articulates here, which I think is very, is very vivid. One may hesitate, he says, because saying such things puts something into our relationship which I am not willing should be there, which I think is an interesting remark to make after, uh, Coral, uh, after Torrell's uh, talk right now about expressiveness and inexpressiveness. It sounds like a very uncavellian thing to say in, in a certain way. I don't want to put something into our relationship which I'm not willing should be there. Here, I'm, I think, here, this, at least, this makes me think of the variety of friends and acquaintances that one has in a life and different types of attachment and shared goods that we have. With some people, I discuss football. With other people, I discuss the new neighborhood restaurant. But my attitude toward football and neighborhood restaurants is different than my attitude toward Hemingway. And expressing these attitudes involves different degrees of self-exposure. Fear of self-exposure can be crippling, as Cavell often suggests. But I take this line about not being willing to put something into our relationship as an indication that full or indiscriminate or sometime, somehow untoward self-exposure, inappropriate self-exposure, can cripple in other ways. Perhaps it's presumptuously uncivil or psychologically unmanageable, at least. Or maybe, and here I'm going on to the next sentence, maybe I hesitate with my Ro Hemingway role in proposal because I don't want to risk your rebuff or discover that we disagree here. I venture to say that nobody exiting a theater with a friend, even an intimate friend, is unfamiliar with such quiet fears. So what do you think of it? It's more than a question about the qualities of a play or a film. It's a test of whether the same things stand out to you and me together. Or the paragraph goes on, my making the proposal might come to see, come to, may come to see more consequential than the proposal itself might get overly mixed up in your knowledge, as Cavell puts it. So that whenever you think of the proposal, whenever you think of the idea, you inevitably think of me, and this might make you chafe, turning your gratitude for the knowledge into hostility for me to prove your independence, he says. 
I venture to say that nobody who's ever had a mentor in a university will be entirely unfamiliar with this kind of emotional and moral struggle. The guidance that we welcome can gradually feel like an imposition. Discernment comes to sound like partiality. Helpful suggestions start to seem like edicts. Despite all my hesitations to talk about Hemingway and Roland, and I think this is really the, the, uh, another aspect of the passage that has always stood out for me, despite all my hesitation to talk about Hemingway and Roland, however, I do sometimes, even often, want to overcome them. It may, says Cavell in the following very brief paragraph, be of overriding importance to me to test the attunement of our intuitions, our agreements in judgment. Here, too, I think such feelings are recognizable, if rarely made explicit. Reading a short story, listening to a sonata, studying a sculpture, these are things that we do by ourselves, but not ones we want to keep to ourselves. Artworks can, form, can elicit forms of companionship and intimacy that aren't found with most other objects we encounter. As Cavell says in his early essay on modern music and his connoisseurs of French painting, or Brazilian bossa nova, or Japanese anime will know, not sharing an aesthetic judgment <laughs> is a specific kind of burden the way that not being believed or not being trusted is a burden. It's not for nothing that new friends and lovers regularly give one another poems, music, or art. They're not just being nice, they're testing out how far they might travel with one another. In recent years, some literary scholars have expressed reservations about the models of political and social critique that have dominated the field for the last few decades. And to some onlookers, <clears throat> such critiques of critique have seemed sentimental, a wish to stop thinking altogether. All post-critique really wants to do, it's sometimes said, is to swoon over great poems. For all I know, some post-critique critics may really want to do just that. But it may be the case that, like Cavell, such scholars are asking us to acknowledge the wishes and needs that drive us to, ju drive us to share our judgments in the first place, whatever the specific, the specific content of those judgments. They may be, they may be noticing that t the testing of our attunements is what criticism is ultimately doing, and that the deep importance of such tests to us frequently leave us feeling vulnerable. The third paragraph here asks why precisely such judgments, seeing Hemingway's ending as a version of Roland's death, would not be regarded as pieces of knowledge. Not that it is simply my disposable opinion or chance association or passing notion, but knowledge. This is a tonally and rhetorically very par paragraph, the hardest of the group to follow. But one implication is a deep connection between things that are usually cordoned off, knowledge on the one hand and conviction and feeling on the other hand. Knowledge of a matter of fact, says Cavell, is often taken to be the most special, since abandoning it would require bringing under suspicion an unforeseeable range of concepts and judgments in terms of which there are such facts for me at all. Unquote. I take this to mean that Forgoing the belief that snow is white, for example, would mean unraveling an untold number of other beliefs. And yet, suggests Cavell, that is not unlike the way I feel about the Hemingway ending. Perhaps he goes on, the depth of my conviction about Hemingway's ending is somewhat shallower than my conviction about the meaning of per certain poems of Blake, but they are deeper at any rate than, the, than a feeling I have about the title of The Red and the Black. That judgment, in contrast to the judgments about Hemingway's ending, is for me hardly more than anything it's hardly more than something one might call an open guess and reveals, he suggests, nothing, nothing, next to nothing about me personally. The final paragraph here returns these insights in an abrupt and uh, unexplained shift to the remarks in the investigations that had first prompted Cavell's meditation on Hemingway. Knowing about for whom the bell tolls is analogous to my knowledge that he has a soul. Neither is a disposition I can adopt at will, he says in those final sentences, but an inflection of myself towards others an orientation which affects everything and which I may or may not be interested in discovering about myself. Philosophy of mind may become aesthetics, but aesthetics may also become philosophy of mind. I want to end, however, with the two sentences that are embedded in the middle of this final paragraph, where Cavell describes the settings in which the expression of such knowledge, of such knowledge might have a home. It's an old fantasy, he writes, or a fact about an older world, that such knowledge was in the possession of certain communities into whose secrets one might have sought initiation. Some people, strangely, take the university to be such a community, 
or perhaps take it as a reminder of such a community, unquote. Recall the Wittgenstein remark that I quoted earlier. Can one learn this knowledge, asked Wittgenstein. Yes, some can, not, however, by taking a course, but through experience of getting the right tip. Recall, too, the student who was reported in The Guardian as saying that in literature courses, a difficult question on a final paper could lead to a disappointing result. Whereas if he knew the maths and the physics, he would be much more confident of achieving his expected grade. What's striking in this tree of remarks is how much ambivalence they all seem to express about our modern educational institutions, or at least about the ability of our educational institutions to foster and sustain the specific forms of knowledge and feeling and conviction that these, the passage that I've been talking about explores. It's noteworthy, I think, that the scene of criticism in Cavell's paragraphs here and elsewhere, the scene of criticism in Cavell's paragraphs is staged mostly as exchanges between you and me, dialogues in which I hope you might catch my interpretive pitches. Elsewhere, Cavell speaks sensitively, movingly, of teachers and students, of learners and learning. But specific classrooms, specific pedagogical techniques, specific course requirements, specific college admissions practices, these things get much less attention in Cavell's work. By contrast, the student quoted in the Guardian article finds these kinds of things unavoidable. They're all he can think about. He feels himself living in an administered world. And for him, the scene of criticism is a scene of bureaucratic evaluation of academic and ultimately career advancement. An American of his age might, have, might feel even greater uh, anxiety. Here, his education would be even more grossly expensive and arguably be even more tied to the pursuit of job credentials and social skills needed to participate in middle class communities. Perhaps more than anyone else, Cavell has expressed the mixture of perceptual intensity and intellectual challenge and existential excitement and moral encounter that drew me, for one, to art and criticism as a young person. I wonder often nowadays whether in the coming few decades, the role that the university has played over the last century or so in initiating such experiences and training such capacities will be drawing to a close or whether criticism will become an ever more marginal field that can be, only, that can be supported only by our, our most world historically wealthy institutions of higher learning. If that were to happen, or if it's happening now, one question would be what, sorts, what other sorts of venues, what other sorts of forums could sustain such reflection and learning and critical activity in lieu of the classroom, the course, or the degree program. For as Cavell suggests, the impulses that lead, at, that lead us to such conversations in the first place run very, very deep, and they are no more likely to go away than will the need to make sense of your friends, your family, your neighbors, or yourself. Thank you.